been part of our uh, series on ophthalmology and, and uh, welcome Professor Paul uh, Foster this morning. Uh, this is really being hosted by uh, Moorfields Education and also the UCL Institute of Ophthalmology, who are partners in offering a number of degree programs as well as uh, really cutting edge research. So it's really a pleasure to have uh, Paul Foster with us this morning. Uh, in a, Paul will be talking to you again about uh, diagnosis and management of angle uh, closure uh, glaucoma, which is an area he's specialized in. Paul is both a, a consultant at Moorfields Eye Hospital, but he's also a professor of ophthalmic epidemiology and glaucoma studies at uh, UCL. So it's really a pleasure to have Paul. Paul has really a, a, a long-term focus and interest uh, in terms of his career in, directed really at clinical characteristics, prevention, and a treatment of primary angle closure glaucoma. So he really is a, a world-leading expert in this area. Moreover, he's done major studies in places like um, Mongolia, Singapore, Bangladesh, Thailand, China, and of course the UK. So this research is really cutting edge. He's authored literally hundreds of, of publications and articles uh, on this topic. And he's also been very involved in the UK Biobank Data Eye and Vision Study. He's also been very involved in the EPIC uh, Norfolk Eye Study. So Paul has really lots to say on this topic, and I'm looking forward to hearing him speak. We are going to use the chat line, so if you um, would just keep your questions going, put them over in the chat line. I will moderate them, and so we'll we'll first turn it over to Paul, let him speak, and then uh, you can just put those questions in the chat line, and and I I will take those uh, after Paul finishes his presentation. So I hope that sounds uh, like a good format, interesting, really looking forward to hearing Paul. So I'm going to turn it over now to Paul. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction, Nora. I, can you, uh, you just confirm that you can hear me and then I'll... Uh, I, I, I can hear you and, and if you put yeah. your video on, see you. I, I, I think you have some slides as well. So so there's your slides. I got some slides and I think I'll just I'll just go through the, the slides if that's OK. Um, so I'm, as Nora said, I'm going to talk about angle closure glaucoma. And the um, the framework for today is that we're just going to briefly outline the signs and symptoms of the condition, uh, consider the risk factors, and then move on to considering the current best evidence for the role of prophylactic treatment doing laser iridotomy, and then look at laser iridotomy versus uh, phaco emulsification, so incisional surgery. Uh, for the more established cases of disease, and then uh, round off by considering the role of other interventions for angle closure glaucoma. So, just to start with, the when we begin ophthalmology, the textbook uh, definition uh, that we we all read about uh, revolves around an acute angle closure episode. So, it's a sudden symptomatic case of ocular hypertension caused by total occlusion of the trabecular meshwork, and it presents with pain, redness, and blurred vision. Now, in the past, that was linked with a very poor prognosis, and it was when I started ophthalmology, it was supposed to be a common cause of blindness. These days, with more modern treatment and being really more, more aggressive, um, we are getting much better outcomes for our patients, and, and usually these people have good or even completely normal visual function, providing they present early and are treated appropriately. The key thing is that this, this condition is not glaucoma. So the, the way that we classify these glaucoma implies a loss of vision. And uh, as I say, most of these people should recover without developing glaucomatous damage to their optic nerve and permanent loss of vision. 
So let's just think about the way that um, symptoms can present in the community. So here I've got a, a graph of the rate of different symptoms that are classically linked with angle closure glaucoma. We've got blurring of vision, nocturnal blurring of vision, red pale eyes, red painful eyes at night, nausea and vomiting, and probably the most uh, typical symptom that people think of when they hear about angle closure is halos around lights. So um, you can see that there are two colored bars, the purple bars, the darker ones of people with angle closure, and the, uh, the lighter bars, the light blue ones, are people from the normal community. Um, and you can see that the, the rates of these symptoms are always higher in the people with angle closure. But there's a lot of people who are normals who do have these same symptoms. And if you look at the halos, uh, there's 25 percent of the normal population will report halo around lights at night. So the take home message is that symptoms are not a particularly good guide to whether people have angle closure disease. So um, one of the things that I did early on in my career and has probably become my most successful uh, publication has been around describing the diagnostic features of glaucoma. And one piece of that that was directly relevant to uh, to uh, my research at the time was defining angle closure disease. And we, we really identified three different stages. And the key thing was that this was based around physical signs, um, not on symptoms. And so we started off uh, identifying a group of people who had just narrow drainage channels at risk of closure. Um, so Nora, you're you're telling me that I I don't have sound, is that correct? Can you hear me? You, you do have sound. It, it's yeah. uh, just in the chat yeah. line. Don't sorry with that. So I'm I'm okay to carry on, am I? You're you're perfect. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's coming okay. through. Everybody um, can hear you. Great. So three different stages of disease. The first one, narrow drainage channels where there was a risk of closure but no evidence of actual disease. The second stage, primary angle closure, was when the, the, there was contact between the iris and the trabecular meshwork um, and that was um, combined with um, a, rate, a rise in intraocular pressure or scarring, peripheral anterior synechi forming between the, the iris and the trabecular meshwork. And then once people had got to that stage, we knew that they were at greater risk of developing glaucoma and having serious permanent loss of vision. So there were three stages, each based on physical signs, not on symptoms. And that's become uh, the global research standard for classification of the disease. So there's a graphic illustration um, and it just illustrate it just gives you an idea of the, the transition from one group to the next. But the key thing is that glaucoma is only diagnosed when there's damage to the optic nerve combined with loss of vision. Um, so in this under this classification scheme, we wouldn't say that somebody who has acute ocular hypertension from uh, an acute episode of angle closure actually has glaucoma because most of the time they're treated well, their vision should remain normal. Now, the disease is more common in Asia, but in terms of trying to underline the relevance of, uh, of the management of this condition in the UK and Europe, we've done a study looking at population based research where the, the examination methods are sufficient to identify the disease if it's there. And so you can see that it's about one person in 200 over the age of 40 in the UK. So white European people, one person in 200 has angle closure with glaucoma. It's around about 1% of people over the age of 70. Three quarters of these people are female. Um, and there's about, in total, there's about a million people with angle closure glaucoma, um, meaning loss of vision in Europe. So it's a smaller number than in Asia, but it's still a fairly sizable number. And one of the features that um, is uh, 
uh, uh, typically associated with angle closure is a small eye. So the axial length of the eye is, is smaller than average. And we've looked at uh, the um, the size of the eye in a population of people living in, in the east of England and found that about 1% of them have an axial length less than 21, which is quite surprising. And because a 20 millimeter eye is usually regarded as really quite small. Um, but if it's one person in a hundred who has that size of eye, then it, you know it's easy to understand how there might be quite a lot of people around who need at least uh, an examination to confirm that they don't have the disease or monitoring uh, to uh, to see whether they are at long term risk of of developing vision loss. Um, and as we go down, you can see there's it's uh, 0 0.14 percent with an axial length less than 18. So more than one person in a thousand has a very small eye where the the, the surgical challenges of dealing uh, with, say, cataract surgery would be significant. Those people are at high risk of developing complications. Um, we found, as you would expect, that most of these people were female. They tended to be shorter height and lower body mass index, so they were generally smaller framed individuals. Um, and they were more likely to be blind have poor vision. We also know that these people typically come from uh, more uh, socially deprived areas of, of the UK. This is work from Birmingham. And the disease is triggered by um, external factors in, in some people at least. So we know that um, uh, dilating the pupil for medical examination, such as diabetic retinopathy screening, um, can trigger an acute episode of angle closure. Recreational drugs, so you can see there we've got cocaine and, and um, uh, ecstasy is another one that's uh, linked with an uh, acute onset of angle closure. But for me in clinics, the commonest um, class of drugs that I see linked with people developing angle closure, and this is particularly younger white patients, it's the antidepressants, and it's all classes of antidepressants, the serotonin selective reuptake inhibitors, um, tricyclic antidepressants, uh, not lithium, but uh, other classes of antidepressants um, do seem to constitute a high risk. There's a variety of idiosyncratic cases, and we've just had somebody uh, in casualty about uh, two weeks ago who had tempiramate induced angle closure. Uh, sulfur drugs, amphetamines, antihistamines, rarely. Uh, lots of people worry about that, but it's actually quite uncommon. And then stress, anxiety, extremes of climate, so either very hot or very cold weather, and that's because people tend to stay indoors if the weather's bad. And indoors, the lighting levels are lower, and people often sit and read or do face down activities. So the combination of darker, light, uh, darker uh, indoor environments and face down posturing is uh, it's almost like a medical provocative test where you're trying to do everything you can to dilate the pupil and let the lens drop forward to induce closure of the uh, the drainage channels. This is a slide that just gives the size of the risk from uh, use of SSRI antidepressants. And you can see here um, on the, uh, um, the second to bottom line, um, uh, an eightfold excess risk uh, for people using um, higher dose SSRIs for developing angle closure glaucoma. So it is quite a significant risk for, for these people. Now, we've long recognised that there appears to be a, um, uh, a genetic basis for angle closure. So um, early on as a consultant, I was seeing patients with um, Marfan syndrome, a few with Ehler-Danlos syndrome. Um, retinitis pigmentosa was always talked about as a uh, possible precipitator for angle closure or possible, possible association for angle closure. I didn't believe that at the time um, and I thought it was more to do with pigmentary retinopathy uh, associated with best maculopathy. Uh, but actually, as time has gone on, we've got more research evidence uh, it has turned out that um, retinitis pigmentosa is linked with angle closure based on this work from Taiwan using the 
National Health Service database. So um, various forms of, of um, uh, inherited ocular syndromes and particularly retinal degenerations. And for me, that's important because there's a lot of these people at Moorfield who um, are in clinics. So we've done research looking at uh, uh, families with angle closure, and this is the pedigree of a, uh, an East London white family. Uh, and this group have formed the basis of a publication that's literally just come out about days ago in PLOS Genetics, describing the first causative gene for angle closure glaucoma. Uh, we've also been in, involved uh, in work. Can't get there we are. So work with colleagues in Singapore, uh, where we've described um, first of all three single nucleotide polymorphisms linked with um, with angle closure glaucoma, and then subsequently another five um, uh, SNPs. Now we know that the the condition is something to do with the iris coming into contact with the trabecular meshwork, and so we've been interested to look at the structural features. Um, and the, the, the histology. Here you can see the, the orangey red staining um, is collagen one. And so the person who's had an acute episode of angle uh, has a lot of collagen one in their iris in the affected eye, also probably more than average in the fellow eye than compared with a normal. So the, the iris is structurally abnormal in people with angle closure. Um, and the iris response to dilation is different. So this is a, uh, on the right hand side, this is a, a graph from a publication from ophthalmology in 2010 by a group in France, where they found that the iris of normal people lost volume. So the, the iris became, became uh, more compacted and, uh, um, and physically smaller with dilation. Whereas they said that the, uh, the iris actually gained volume with dilation um, in people with angle closure. In fact, it didn't gain volume. Um, the mathematics around that was wrong, but, but it, what, what they found was it just didn't lose volume like normal eyes. Um, so the irises behave differently. And so we think we're seeing is a combination of three different factors. It's smaller eyes, abnormal connective tissue, and also the genetics points towards some kind of um, inherited abnormality of tissue movement across fluid boundaries, all um, coming together to increase the risk of angle closure. So the principles of management are, first of all, you've got to diagnose the condition, working out whether it's primary or secondary. Um, you treat the two conditions differently. Um, primary disease occur, occurs in smaller than average eyes. Um, it tends to be symmetrical and you manage it by breaking down the barriers to fluid flow initially with a laser iridotomy, sometimes taking the lens out and then sometimes doing a vitrectomy. In comparison, secondary angle closure, the eyes are more normal sized, uh, often very asymmetrical presentation. So very florid signs in one eye and the other eye looks completely normal. And you have to tackle the root underlying cause. Um, and the key thing really when these people are managed in casualty uh, is that you would use pilocarpine for the primary cases and atropine or another pupil dilating for the secondary cases. And if you do get it the wrong way around, you actually make the patient worse. So this primary versus secondary diagnosis is very important. Now, the question around when to use laser iridotomy is very important. My friend Dave Friedman, who's currently a professor at um, uh, Massachusetts Eye and Ear Hospital and at Harvard University, suggested we do a trial looking at whether preventive laser treatment was helpful in, in um, stopping people getting the disease. My student at the time, um, Herman Guang, who's currently a professor at Melbourne University, set up a trial uh, where we've screened 12,000 people in China, got about 900 people into the trial, and we intended to follow them for three years. We actually had to follow them uh, for six years in the end to, to get an outcome. Um, and this work was published in The Lancet a couple of years ago. And basically what we found was that laser iridotomy halved the rate of people developing incident new cases of angle closure. So this hazard ratio of 0 0.5 halving the risk in the treated groups. But the rate of new disease really was very low. Um, 
we had to extend the follow up um, from three years to, to six years because we didn't see a benefit at three years. So it took longer for the benefits uh, of the preventive treatment to show up. And the key thing here, we, you can see the, the top group, acute angle closure cases. So there were five cases untreated who developed acute episodes of angle closure and one treated case. Uh, but three of the controls, three of the the, um, uh, the normals and one of the uh, the treated occurred after dilation. So the rate of spontaneously occurring acute angle closure was really very small. There were only two spontaneous cases in the whole trial. Um, the rest of the endpoints were PAS and relatively modest IOP elevation. So most of the disease was not immediately sight threatening or symptomatic. Um, and so then we've started looking at the number of people that we would need to treat. So to prevent one new case of disease, you've got to treat about 260 people over the course of a year. And to prevent one case over six years, it's 44, which is so it's quite a lot of work you've got to do to prevent one case of relatively mild disease. And then in terms of preventing sight loss from glaucoma, you've got to, you've got to treat over 120 people to prevent one new case of glaucoma in 10 years. So the conclusion from this work was that we should only really be treating uh, the people at very highest risk. Certainly that means treating the fellow eye of people who have presented with an acute episode, but widespread use of peripheral iridotomy as prevention in people who just have a narrow angle is probably, certainly in the UK, probably not worth the effort. You need to have additional risk factors uh, for justifying that treatment. So the, the policy change that we're now recommending is offer PI only to the highest risk cases where there's maybe a family history or a need for regular pupil dilation. This graph is an interesting one and it shows the the solid line um, up at the top in in darker um, uh, uh, darker shading is the um, the rate of acute presentations to angle to hospital with exposure. And you can see that in the late 90s, those acute presentations started to decline quite significantly. And that happened about 10 years after an increase in the, uh, the, the rate of cataract surgery in the UK. And so some had suggested that cataract surgery would um, reduce the risk of people getting angle closure. Uh, myself and one of my students, Alex Day, said, well, it might all be due to the, the, the widest, more widespread use of laser iridotomy. You can see figures here from uh, Australia and also from the UK. And there was an increase in the rate of PIs from around about 2000, um, which might be feeding into it. Having said that, uh, colleagues in Scotland then I think nailed the, the issue here where they've shown a declining rate of acute angle closure, APAC, an increasing rate of cataract surgery. And those two, those two lines seem to mirror each other. They're really, you know, as the cataract rate goes up, the acute angle closure rate goes down. And then the, uh, the short dashed line um, that declines in line with the PAC and then suddenly shoots up at the end um, is the laser iridotomy rate. So it appears that laser iridotomy rates are having no impact um, in, on a population level on the, um, the presentations with acute angle closure. Being aware of that, one of my colleagues um, at the time at Aberdeen University, Augusto Rizuro Blanco, uh, set up this trial, the EAGLE trial, which uh, it's out to ask whether clear lens FACO, so basically doing catara early cataract surgery was safe, effective and cost effective. Um, and so patients were randomized to either FACO or laser iridotomy if they had um, angle closure with a pressure of 30 or they had angle closure with glaucoma damage to their vision. Uh, we had some exclusion criteria there. Um, and the, the key thing about this study was that the primary outcome measure was patient reported quality of life using eq 5 d There were some clinical outcomes like the intraocular pressure and also health economics outcomes. 
Uh, most patients were drawn from uh, the population of the UK. There were some from China and Malaysia and one site in Australia. Um, and here you can see the EQ5D scores. So the key thing here is that the baseline and the final follow-up measures for lens extraction were the same, but the patients who had laser iridotomy, they started off with a slightly better quality of life. And at the end of the study, they were reporting a lower quality of life, and this was statistically significant. Um, so patients who have laser iridotomy seem to be a bit less happy and a bit less satisfied with their health and well-being uh, compared to people who have the lens extraction. The pressures were lower in the lens extraction group than the laser group, uh, and crucially, the people in the lens extraction group 60% of them didn't need any medication, compared to only 20% of the laser group being off all medication. So really, if you don't like using medication, um, uh, then um, the, the, the being in the lens extraction group was the, the better group to be in. Complication rates and a need for additional surgery, you can see there's a lot more surgery done um, in the um, uh, in the uh, uh, the laser group, um, and then complication rates all pretty much what you'd expect um, in the, uh, the lens extraction group. But actually, um, it, uh, later on, the laser iridotomy group um, seemed to get quite quite a lot of complications. Um, so. The key thing for the UK and the National Health Service was the cost of this, and it did seem to be more cost effective to do the, the lens extraction surgery, so a bigger, more expensive procedure earlier on, paying um, dividends and saving money uh, within three years. So uh, at the end of the study, we, we thought that uh, lens extraction surgery was the superior intervention. And this is just a, 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 a cross-section limit on the left before somebody has had uh, the lens extraction procedure. On the right afterwards, it's the same person. You can see the angles closed um, in the, the, the before one and wide open in the after picture. So, um, you know, that, that shows in one picture why the procedure um, works well. Um, other options for treating the can, can use medications, so timolol <clears throat> um, and latanoprost have been compared, and latanoprost um, outperforms timolol. That's the same with all prostaglandin analogues. <clears throat> and then here we've got a study where um, prostaglandins were compared with selective laser trabecular plasty. Now, really, you can only do this after you've done a laser iridotomy or FACO. Um, and got the, the drainage angle wide open. But it appears that um, prostaglandins outperform selective laser trabecular plasty. So if you do need to lower the pressure, it's probably uh, using a prostaglandin drop. And then finally, um, for people who present with an acute, acute episode of angle closure and casualty, um, if you can't control their pressure, then using diode laser cycloablation is a good option. Doing an acute trabeculectomy is not a good option. The complication rates are very high, and they do tend to fail within a month or six weeks of performing the uh, the surgery. So, diode is quick, simple, safe, and effective. Uh, and that is the uh, that's all that I wanted to say um, to to give you an outline of uh, diagnosis and management of angle closure. So I'm happy to take questions if you have them. Yeah, Paul, Paul uh, there's a request for you to just go back and um, vis revisit slide 33 and slide 46. Just if you could go back right, over so the... there's 46. And then I think so the other one was, you know, if you could go over those again. There we go. So basically, we excluded people with bad glaucoma, those who had had a previous acute attack, 
who had some cataracts and would need cataract surgery anyway, um, or who had very small eyes and those who had had previous treatment for angle closure. Okay, so so that that's terrific, and and um, we've got some questions coming in, Paul. But before we get to those, maybe I can just ask you a a, a slightly personal question, and and that is really, you know, tell us a little more about your own personal trajectory and and how you came to to really on this particular research. So I um, <clears throat> I was trying to become an ophthalmologist at a time when the, um, uh, the there were a lot of other people who had the same aims and uh, uh, so I found that I needed to go off and do something to improve my uh, career prospects and that was going off to Mongolia to do research. Now at the time I really didn't know exactly where Mongolia was. Um, but uh, when I found out that it was uh, sandwiched between Siberia and China, um, it, I, I knew at the time that it, there was likely to be a lot of angle closure glaucoma, and I was fortunate to be working with uh, a ophthalmologist uh, who uh, has literally only just retired from Oxford Eye Hospital, John Salmon, um, who had done a lot of work on angle closure glaucoma in South Africa. Um, and um, John, uh, you know, John knew all about the uh, the, the you know, best examination methods. Taught me how to um, identify the disease. Put me in touch with a lot of very useful people, and gave me lots of good reading to do. Um, and so I was sent off to Mongolia for uh, four months, and then. Uh, after having completed that piece of work, went to the Singapore National Eye Centre for nearly four years working out there. So I was based in, in the Far East for over four years doing this research. Uh, and it was a great opportunity because at the time, very little was known about angle closure. Um, and we're building evidence right, you know, right from uh, almost a clean sheet. Um, and it's, uh, I, I think it's, we, you know, we've made very rapid progress uh, through to those clinical trials that I've just shown you, those really give us a, a very solid evidence-based framework for the management of the, the disease. These days, we're probably not going to be doing any preventive laser treatments, and most people with established angle closure disease, phaco emulsification early, you know, surgery technically identical to cataract surgery um, and that works very well it's generally safe generally effective um, and patients are happy with the result so so let's get into the questions Paul but one of the questions uh, is what do you feel like is the reason behind it being more present in Poor, people of poor backgrounds? Is it about access? Is it about education? Is there a link to nutrition? What, what are your thoughts about this question? So, I, yeah, I think it's it's very much multifactorial, and I'm sure that, that poor access to healthcare services is part of the story. Um, the, the education question is interesting. Um, one of my um, previous students um, who's now in, in Cambridge working as a public health specialist, Jennifer Yip, looked at the relationship between education and um, angle closure glaucoma. And, you know, we, we do think that educational attainment is protective, and that probably is through the acquired myopia. So people who, who do spend more time in education and, and get more qualifications, they tend to be more myopic. Their eyes tend to be physically bigger, um, and that reduces their risk of, of angle closure. But it does bring with it a whole range of other potential problems. So a higher risk of open angle glaucoma, higher risk of um, uh, retinal detachment, uh, myopic macular degeneration, cataracts, etc. So it's you know it's all a bit of a trade-off. Um, you know you you relinquish the risk of one disease and you get higher risks of other disease in return. Um, it's yeah it's a complex relationship. 
um, but I think they're probably the two main main drivers. It's you know some kind of socioeconomic uh, reduced access to optometry um, checking and and something to do with um, the the you know higher earning more educated individuals just having a, a different eye size and shape which you know puts them at less risk of angle closure and greater risk of other things. Uh, that, that's really interesting, Paul, and, and there's a, a bit of a follow-on about that. I mean, is there evidence that lens dimensions in angular closure are abnormals? You know, example, yeah. extra thick, or is yeah. it just small eyes? No, it's it's the, the so that a lot of um, the early work around the the physical size of the eye and different bits of the eye. There are two two figures who did. The bulk of that founding research in the late 60s and, and through the 70s. So one of them, uh, Ron Lowe, who was an ophthalmologist in Melbourne, um, uh, early on identified that people with angle closure had a, a bigger, fatter than average lens. So it's the, the front to back dimensions of the lens were bigger. And in addition, the lens sat further forwards inside the eye. So it's something that, you know, there's the, the eye is physically smaller. The lens inside the eye is physically bigger and it sits further forwards. And all of those things come together to compromise the, the width of the drainage channels and, and make it more likely that the angle will close. And, and with that uh, ZAP study, did very low numbers uh, have uh, pharmacological induced closed angle episodes less than expected? So we we weren't sure. I mean, the the, the received wisdom is that the the rates of um, pharmacologically induced angle closure are very low. So the 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 um, the, the head of the UK diabetic retinopathy screening network said that uh, that you know that when i last spoke to him this was a while ago you know that in his memory there had never been a case of angle closure caused by pupil dilation for diabetic retinopathy screening now you know at ophthalmologists working in hospital do see those and so there's no doubt that you know that that was um um uh, a consequence of the, the diabetic retinopathy people just not knowing what effect they were having um, on people in the community. But the, ri the risks are low and it's been looked at in several population studies, the Baltimore Eye Study and the Rotterdam Eye Study, um, one of which they dilated. I think the Rotterdam study was 1,000 people, Baltimore was about Every thousand, we we did induce uh, four cases of angle closure. So the dilating people. Blanco, they looked at. Um, uh, onset of angle closure in Scotland nationwide and the commonest cause in Scotland closure was having their pupil dilated. Paul, uh, can you hear me? Paul? Yeah, I'm here. Hello. Yeah. There's a, there's a question about treatment, uh, and uh, particularly a drug called pilocarpin. Uh, is it yeah. no longer used for uh, the acute phase uh, for patients that present in an A and E? So at the beginning, I said that there was um, a, an important diagnostic. A decision to be made when people come to A and E, and that's deciding whether they have primary or secondary angle closure. 
um, and I said that the, um, the the drug that is often used first line uh, in A&E for primary angle closure is pilocarpine. It's an old drug, um, but it's still very useful. It does exactly what we need it to do in the acute setting. So yeah, that's very much used. But the key thing is that it, you have to recognize people who have a secondary angle closure mechanism, either due to um, cataract or a dislocated lens um, or to do with um, side effects of medication. I mentioned to pyramate those people with secondary angle closure don't do well if you give them pilocarpine. And so you need to recognize that it's a secondary case and then they tend to do better with pupil dilating medications like cyclopentolate or atropine rather than pupil constricting medications like pilocarpine. And how about patients with asymptomatic uh, packs? What is your recommendation for managing those? So <clears throat> the conclusion from the ZAP study was that they shouldn't be uniformly encouraged to have prophylactic laser iridotomy. I mean, it, 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 in um, you know, even in more fields, these people are picked up uh, as um, you know incidental findings in casualty, and and um, the doctor seeing them scares the life out of them by saying you're going to go blind tomorrow unless you have a laser treatment. Um, and then, you know, they, they get very upset uh, because they have to wait overnight before they see somebody and then they find they're going to have to wait several weeks to get into my clinic for an opinion uh, and be given what they believe to be sight saving treatment. Um, so we're very much trying to um, discourage the the alarmist approach to counselling patients that laser iridotomy is absolutely essential. I would say that it, you know if people are a long way from medical services, uh, and that would include you know there, there are a few people um, in the armed forces from Afghanistan that I've seen who had acute episodes actually you know when they were on the ground um in the line of duty uh, and it usually takes two or three days to get them back you know to a to a to an airport flown back through the mediterranean back to the uk and then into a uk hospital so you know somebody in a very remote location like that or possibly an aid worker in a remote location <clears throat> living up the amazon somewhere or um maybe a bit closer to home oil rig workers um, or somebody may be living in the remote area of the UK, a long way from a hospital. But more likely, the, I think the biggest group are the ones who have diabetes or another retinal condition where they need regular pupil dilation. So that's going to be the, you know, the bulk of it. Um, <clears throat> when people need to have their pupil dilated regularly, they're the ones at risk, and they're the ones who should probably have prophylactic treatment if their drainage angles are closed already or maybe you know somebody with a family history their sisters had an acute attack then they probably are worth treating prophylactically as well and why do you think that we're still doing so many pis on narrow angles when the evidence for prevention benefit is so low so the um, the evidence literally is only a year old and uh, it does take a while for practice patterns to change. Uh, my hope is that we're rewriting the um, the Royal College of Ophthalmologists guidelines for management of angle closure. And when um, when those new guidelines come out, um, it, it, I think it does uh, focus the mind of the, the you know, the the the, the ophthalmolog frontline ophthalmologists on what is right and proper practice. If it's said, you know, if it's something that's included in a, a college guideline, then I think people are, you know, feel more confident in adopting that into their day to day clinical practice rather than trying to interpret evidence themselves individually. Um, so I hope within the next year or so, um, that we'll see that practice change. Uh, obviously, in the current, uh, you know, sort of COVID endemic climate, we're we're very much looking carefully at uh, what is absolutely necessary treatment and what is the sort of the, the 
you know the perfect treatment in the ideal world and we're very much reining back from um a absolute perfection to doing what is you know what is currently necessary to stop site loss so are you saying then there's going to be uh even less uh prophylactic uh ips I, yeah i think so i mean we do about 500 a year in more fields um so you know to around 10 a week uh, maybe maybe a bit more than that um and i would expect that number to go down to maybe one or two a week um it, within a couple of years um <clears throat> but it you know it just depends how people vote with their feet uk ophthalmologists uh, when we've done a survey at um uh, uh, uh the uk ophthalmology society there, there was um you know if, before we presented the evidence there was enthusiasm for offering prophylactic treatments and then after we presented the evidence i, th I think that the you know the number had gone from about 80 percent down to 50 percent who would offer that treatment so it's going to take us a while to um you know get the idea ingrained uh, with most ophthalmologists. Interestingly, in the US, um, the presentation of this clinical trial data made no impact on uh, people's um, plans to, you know, the um, US ophthalmologists, obviously most of them in private practice, uh, said that they would still be carrying on offering prophylactic laser iridotomies to their patients. Now, the, the, the economic case around this is an interesting one and it, it very much hinges on whether you would uh, continue to offer follow-up um, and what that follow-up costs so in the US if you have to pay to see uh, an ophthalmologist for lifelong monitoring it actually probably is cheaper to go ahead and have the prophylactic treatment rather than pay for the ongoing follow-up whereas in the UK the, the National Health Service optometric, you know, eye testing program, um, we believe gives better value for money and probably makes it possible for us to say to people, you're at low risk, see your optician once a year, any problems come back and we'll, you know, we'll do whatever needs to be done in the future. So there, there probably is a difference in the approach for the UK versus the US and then obviously other um, healthcare models around the world will be different. So I think this is something that has to be approached on a country by country basis. So for someone who is a, a PAC suspect with low risk factors referred to an eye service, would you recommend monitoring them manually through the hospital or would you think it's just safe to discharge them for monitoring the community? So based on the ZAP study, the, the, you know, ZAP we were working in the highest risk population on earth and we were finding the highest risk members of the highest risk population and then you know the the study showed that the rates of new disease were really pretty low they were much lower than we were led to believe by you know previous um, research so in the UK because the rates of angle closure are lower you would you would believe that the risks are lower and therefore you know there probably is little to be gained by um, keeping those people under regular hospital follow-up um, it really the thing that's going to trigger uh, the need for treatment is to rise in in eye pressure and the opticians are very good at, at finding uh, elevated eye pressure and so I, I you know i'd be confident that in most cases people will get sent back to the hospital system um <clears throat> you you could argue that if they have an acute episode and they don't present promptly uh then they may end up worse off but you know if they if people have an acute episode and they come in quickly which most do <clears throat> the results tend to be good and you know i'm i'm very upbeat about the outcomes that we get for acute angle closure management these days which patients would you definitely recommend laser pis over observation for pac um so th those you know I, i've sort of outlined the um the, the people who are remote from hospital services so sir you know servicemen aid workers oil rig workers um and 
people with diabetes you know if, if they need regular pupil dilation for uh, monitoring of their retinal disease and they have narrow angles then they probably do need a pi so i think that's going to be the the, the main group that uh, we'll be treating in the future question where uh would you put those pis uh you know do you put them around noon uh three nine so yeah there's there's a lot of debate around this and um th there is uh one clinical trial that suggests the um the rate of side effect vis visual disturbance is, is the 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 primary side effect that you're worried about with these people um and um the the, the the there's one clinical trial from canada that suggests if you put the iridotomy at 12 o'clock underneath the upper lid there are more visual side effects than if you put the the iridotomies fully exposed at three and nine o'clock um uh, another trial done in india suggests there's no difference in the side effects uh my personal take as a you know probably the uk's highest volume angle closure practitioner is that since I've I've changed my policy to do them uh, do the iridotomies um, in the horizontal meridian three and nine o'clock um, I see less people uh, noticing visual side effects and the problem is that the people who notice them they tend to be young they tend to be anxious and then um, uh, it takes a lot of time reassuring these people and you can have lengthy conversations year after year after year with these people um, and that that just melted away when we made the change from from superior to lateral location so I'm I'm very clear that there appears to be a benefit for my patients um, the one downside of the lateral position is that they're technically more difficult to do the, the iris is just um uh, uh more challenging to 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 get a full thickness iridotomy in that location but still you know, if, if you're doing these regularly it's not um it's not insurmountable you just do notice it's a little bit more difficult For patients that meet criteria for lens extraction over LPI, what is your current practice? Is, are, are they still accommodated? Sorry, I, I, what, what do you mean accommodated? Uh, in terms of uh, if they meet that uh, criteria for the lens extraction yeah. over LPI, yeah. uh, so what is your practice? Do, do, you, do you go forward with the, the extraction? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we started um, early on. This is in reference to the young, by the way. Sorry, say that again. For our young. Yeah. So I've done clear lens extractions on people in their twenties, um, and clearly, the you know the 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 impact of complications on people who have clear lens extraction is is very significant so it is is something that requires careful handling uh, and the primary thing the primary practical issue um, it, it revolves around consent um, so you have to spend time talking to people and explaining that this isn't cataract surgery um we have a, a cataract surgery generic consent form in in more fields and it's absolutely crucial that our residents don't use the the standard consent form because it just says you're having cataract surgery you can't see we're going to see better sign here whereas you know this is very much different in terms of risk and benefits and the the aims of the treatment so there's got to be you know a thought and and careful discussion but you know those discussions start early on in the care pathway in my clinic, and so most most patients know what the the deal is by the time we get to surgery. You know, the, on when we have people with acute episodes, um, you know, one of the first things that's said to them is we're probably going to be doing an operation to take your lens out 
to open up the drainage channels and and you know they hear that after to, to listing the surgery they you know they've heard it several times and they know uh, what uh, what they're in for, um, but yes, it's you know it is now standard practice among uh, glaucoma specialists around the world, um, and I think people believe providing it's approached um, carefully and you're an experienced surgeon, the results are very good. I'm going to take one last question, uh, and, and that is, are there any anatomical features in PACS that you would consider higher risk? So the, the smaller the eye, the greater the problems it causes, um, both in terms of risk of, of the, the disease itself and the complications of treatment. Um, I talked early on about the, the axial length and said that a 21 millimeter eye is unusually small uh, the average for the uk is about it's about 23 in women and the standard deviation is is one millimeter so um you know once you get down to 21 you're two standard deviations below the the population mean and that's you know that's when you'd say okay this is an unusually small eye when you get below 20 millimeters, the the risks of surgery do start to go up, and basically the the risks risks of surgery double with every millimeter uh, shorter the eye is below 21. Uh, so you know you, you double the risk from 21 to 20. Uh, so you've got fourfold excess risk between 21 and 90 and eightfold risk between 21 and, and 18. So, you know, it's a, when you get down to the 15 and 16 millimeter eyes, it's a near certainty you're going to have surgical complications. Thank you so much, Paul. It's been fascinating and uh, really interesting work that you, you do. And, and I can see that the audience has really appreciated it as well. So again, you know, this is part of Moorfield's education and, and the education that's jointly offered through UCL and the Institute of Ophthalmology. And we look forward to engaging you in other ways uh, in the near future. Thank you, and thank you, Paul. My pleasure.